Hey everybody, Peyton here. This week we had the pleasure of interviewing Mike Bosey, a mastering engineer at Bernie Grunman Mastering in Hollywood. Mike has been active in the music industry for upwards of two decades, working with artists such as Post Malone, Tyler the Creator, Mac Miller, Kendrick Lamar, Childish Gambino, SZA, Doja Cat. You get the idea. The guy is super talented and people know to go to him to get things mastered perfectly. Here is our conversation. Hey, well, first of all, thanks for doing this. We really like talking to uh, you know behind the scenes sort of people who don't usually get a chance to to make their work known, even though everyone benefits from it. It's a pleasure. I mean, it's it's weird to me being around mastering for so long that people finally care to know what it is <laughs> or know who people are but i think that's one of those positive things that's kind of coming out of technology and information sharing like it, you can find those things out now and i don't know that you could before you know unless you're like unless you're like reading the liner notes or something yeah i mean and who has liner notes anymore it's it's you know i'm i'm at an age where I straddle the old and the new school. And it's like, I grew up reading album liner notes to find out who recorded or mixed or mastered even before I knew what those things were. And now with digital, it's so immediate and an afterthought almost that, um, you know, finding who worked on things, you can dig and find it. It's just not right in front of you. There's no tangible thing. Uh, to kind of give out those credits. So it, I just think it's cool that, that people know who any mastering guy is, let alone me. So, Yeah. Do you think the notoriety of mastering in general is getting more and more? Or did that has that kind of been a constant and it's only gone down since digital liner notes became a thing? Do you mean as far as people knowing who mastering guys are? Being, yeah, like when when you introduce yourself at a party and you say, "Oh, I'm a mastering engineer." Do people right. does that track? Do people no. get that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on the audience, right? If I'm talking to anybody who's in the business in a technical stand, you know, kind of position, or or at least know the workings of the releasing of an album, right, and, and how that production line works as a whole. They kind of have an idea, but, you know, somebody who has no idea what about the music business in general, I, I, I just try and layman it out. There's, there's, it's too complex and, and I'm too boring of a person to get into that longer conversation with. I'm a pencil pusher in an office mm -hmm. for my mm -hmm. day job. And that's about the extent that I'll go. So it's nice to know that other people do that too. <laughs> for sure. I mean, I, I'll, I get long winded with the people who tolerate me being long winded, but most people don't give a crap. <laughs> Do you think uh, there is more of an unsung hero in the music creation world than mixing and mastering? Like, is there anybody less well known than those guys? It, it's interesting. You know, there's a push right now in the in the industry to recognize and acknowledge songwriters for their contributions, and and um. You know, mastering is the last thing in the chain, right, of putting out an album. But w one of the first things is the songwriters. So just from my perspective, most people know the mixers or the artists and maybe the producers, if they're also artists or they're, you know, they have shout outs on tracks or whatever that is. Like, they're they're the big name people. That's OK. Like, I, I to to. To say that my mastery makes me a, on the level of people who are doing way more creative things in the process, I'm not saying what I do isn't important, but like, yeah, those producers and those writers and the artists are performing. I'm doing my little craft. So mm -hmm. I, I just think it's great that people care to find out now. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, the Grammys, if you put any importance on them, they didn't give Grammys to mastering people until like 20 years ago. So think of all the albums that mastering engineers just worked on and didn't get any notoriety for. So to finally get in this place where through the help of mixers and producers, I'm not saying they don't, you know, 
they try and boost up their buddies and I have mixed friends that try and promote me and I do the same. Like, I just think that there's a lot more, uh, to spread around and people aren't, you know, kind of keeping all of their, you know, trophies or whatever you call it accolades to themselves. They're more apt to kind of reach out and share that wealth. And that's really kind of uh, a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine like, that's a whole, I don't know, like collective, you know, effort on there. Um, you well, right. I mean, when you realize that that's what it is, you yeah. know, like I, I realize the lane that I am in within the business and I understand what my job is within the project. And when you get teams together that that know what they do and trust the other people to know what they do, you get great final products. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um and that comes with being able to admit that, like, I don't know everything and I'm going to let this guy do what he does right and be open to, you know, critique and all that business. In your experience, what exactly is like that process? Like, is it like you have all these minds in this room or is this um, a lot of here, we'll work on this piece right now, email it your way on the other side of the country and then email it back? Or is it like a like a real like one on one or we're all kind of sitting down kind of collecting. It's effort. it's really everything. Right. Um I think in like I've been here almost thirty years now. So like I started in the early nineties. Most mastering sessions were attended by the artist or a label person, an A and R person, maybe a producer, maybe an entourage, right? Like Oh interesting. I, I remember one of the first big sessions when I was at the studio was a Snoop session and there was like 20 people there. And now I'm surprised if I meet people that I do albums with, you know what I mean? So it, it's really? different. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of old school and that I like to have people in my room with me because I feel like that's what I love about this job, right? That interaction between people, the, um, you know, common goal of achieving a great sounding thing and you need that feedback. It's not to say I don't take mail-in projects because majority of the things I do are, but there's usually some sort of instruction or direction or, hey, these are the things that you did that I like. Make me sound like, <laughs> like that person. Um, so it's kind of all over the map and, and figuring out how to deal with each project has its own challenges. Sometimes not having any input is great. And sometimes you struggle to kind of find the direction without any input. You said uh, a lot of times you do get directions. I think I saw an interview you did about working with Tyler, the creator, and he said, make it sound gross. Mm -hmm. uh, is, <laughs> is that the weirdest request? Or have you ever said no to a request by an artist about make it sound like this? No, it's not the re weirdest request. Like Tyler's fun with it, right? And he was in the room and and Neil Pogue, who mixed that album and the past two albums that I've done um, with Tyler and Neil, like we have fun with it. That's just his way of, you know, I, I think saying, you know, we don't have to be so precious with this. You know what I mean? And And everybody, every project, every artist, they have their own language of communicating what they want with you. And and I think. Um, like I've had people send me five page emails of why this concept album is going to change the world. You know what I mean? And, and that doesn't necessarily inform my mastering, but maybe it allows me a little bit of perspective into who this person is. And maybe I can get a little wild with it, or maybe I need to, you know, be really respectful to what it is because they love it as it is. And what is mastering going to do? I don't want to screw it up, you know, but but there's no, I've never said no to a request from somebody because, you know, like I was saying earlier, I'm the mastering guy. That's my job. So this, I didn't make this music. This is Tyler's music. So if Tyler wants it to sound this way, I'll do everything within my skill set to make that happen, you know, and tell him maybe why or why not I would do a certain thing. But ultimately, like, I'm just... I'm trying to get the best sounding thing that the client is going to approve. Everybody at the label is going to be happy with. Hopefully the fans love. Um, but yeah, I've never said, no, I'm not going to do that. 
I'll, I'll tell you why that's maybe not the best idea in the world, but then we can try it. <laughs> you know, like, I, I think that's where you also break boundaries and, and discover shit excuse me for swearing is when you just throw all the rules out and and sometimes that's fun to do and sometimes it's absolutely the wrong thing to do but you don't know until you kind of screw around with it and, and try it yeah yeah i love that mindset do you think that is more common with hip-hop artists like is that a reason you tend to work with them more than anybody else or is there is there something you like about hip hop that gives you a little bit more freedom to to experiment? What you can do in hip hop with with the way the sounds are, you can, you know, I can I can push things a little bit more than I can in more of an organic sounding instrument. So if you were to have you know, an acoustic set, I can't I can't master that with the same type of aggressiveness or intention of making a certain thing sound you know, like in hip hop, we're always trying to accentuate the bottom or clarify the bottom or make sure that it's present enough. At least I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I do that with a jazz recording, it's not going to sound right. It doesn't sound natural. Um, so I think hip hop just it, uh, it lends itself to a little bit more experimentation, as does like electronic music, certainly with volumes, because I, I can get that stuff a lot louder than I can a rock record without it kind of distorting or falling apart at high volumes. But I think I just, you know, your, your track record dictates who you work with. And the guy that I replaced, Brian Gardner, he, he mastered every West Coast record of note from the mid eighties until he retired and I took the room over. So I inherited some of his clients and some of his connections, but I had been making those over the 20 years, 25 years of assisting him. So um, you know, I, I just think it's natural that the people that were coming here for that came here and tried me out knowing me because I was, again, knowing all the people that were working with him and they knew me by my name. So it was kind of an easier transition into more hip hop. But I myself think, you know, my goal is to be well-rounded in everything because I don't want to be just the hip hop guy. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with being the LA hip hop guy. You know what I mean? Like, but I, I want to master every type of music because I love music. And, and there are similarities in every genre to me that, that I can touch on and, and draw from. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. A couple of years ago, I was talking to somebody about, you know, trying to, to work with more Latin artists. And now I'm working with more Latin artists. And I don't know if that's, you put things out into the universe and that comes back to you or what, but, you know, realizing, and, and in the past year, like more French artists, you just do work. And then your work speaks for itself within those communities. I just want to expand it. So I get to do a little bit of everything. And so far I've been lucky enough to, to work in most genres to me it's 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 people pay me to do this it's it's fun so like why not expand and see how much how much i can learn too because i'm the greatest part about being an engineer in this business and i think any mixer would tell you the same thing is like there's never a recipe it's it's always changing and if you're a you know one of those mind types that like to be challenged or figure out little puzzles or recipes within recipes and maybe be a little OCD and insane. <laughs> this is for you, you know? Yeah, that totally checks out. <laughs> Do you think... Any, any engineer that says they're not a little off-kilter is lying. <laughs> you, guys, you guys get into the weeds, I feel like, especially with the technical aspect of it. You know, right. just watching some of the, the videos and work that you guys do, it it is so in-depth and technical on a level that, uh, frankly, I can't comprehend. And I think it's fair to say most people don't even know what they're looking at most of the time. Right. Well, interestingly enough, I'm not technical at all. And I'm the first guy to tell you that. Like, I I didn't go to school for this. I learned everything on the job. And, and you know, I don't know that that's going to be the normal way anymore, right? With 
you get an opportunity to have mentorships as the old industry did. And that, I think that that's great because more people can do it. It kind of sucks because there's a little bit of lack of knowledge. But then again, it's great again because there's channels doing broadcasts and podcasts and streaming. Are you are you trying to keep that going? Like, do you have your eye out for mentees? Do you want to continue that mentorship mindset going? Well, yes, yes. Um, but we don't do mentorships here. The trajectory of a career in mastering is very interesting. At least mine was right. I got hired here when I was 23, part time, night time, and worked my way up to running this room. And that's but that took me 20 years because I didn't go to school because I didn't know things because I needed to learn. But also in that era, there weren't 10,000 mastering engineers, right? And this studio, I'm going to use my sports analogy, is like I'm playing for the Dodgers. I'm on the roster. I might not be every day, but I'm on the team. So just stick around, stick it out. You know what I mean? And, and learn. It, it sucked when I was doing it. I complained about struggling through it during it when I was younger. But, you know, obviously hindsight, it it all fell into place. And I feel extremely, extremely lucky. But um, most of my knowledge is built off of observation. You know, working for a studio with as many engineers with the accolades they have and all of them being open to sharing information is I couldn't get that education. You know what I mean? So while you watch everybody succeed, and I think it's probably a little bit harder nowadays because everybody's everything is so upfront, their successes and none of the failures. Like it's, it's hard because you're watching other people win and maybe you don't feel like you're winning. Um, and I certainly felt that way, even without anybody to compare myself to. You're just <laughs> trudging along, hoping for your shot. That grind is prevalent everywhere in any sort of artistic industry, even though you, know, you, you think of it more as behind the scenes or not as creative or as artistically unique. It is a battle, and it is a battle of attrition to just keep grinding at it. Do you... Absolutely. Do you, do you still have that hunger? I mean, uh, you said you got a studio full of mastering engineers. Do you guys try to pick the artists you want to to work with? Do you kind of tra try to stay civil with it? Or do you go, <laughs> go for who you want and let the chips fall where they may? It's cutthroat. No. Um, <laughs> everybody at this studio, and, and again, I know how lucky I am, is a family. Like half the people that still work here were here when I was hired almost 30 years ago. Every engineer who's a mastering engineer here has been here for at least 20 to 25. So competitiveness, I, I think we're more competitive in that we want to keep the entire studio open in an industry where that's, you know, harder and harder to do. Right. And we also benefit from having like Bernie Grunman is a legend, right? And we have Pat Sullivan, who is a Grammy winner, who does a ton of soundtrack stuff. We have myself who does what I do. We have Bernie who does everything. We have Chris who does a ton of vinyl cutting, Neil Young, Tom Petty. So everybody's got a lane within the studio, but we all kind of contribute towards winning. And by winning, I just mean like getting the project done and, and and being happy with it. Like nobody's above lending a hand. Uh, I've certainly gone to Bernie for advice. Bernie's come to me to listen to something in his room. Like, what? <laughs> so um, like I, I still am in awe of the people that I work with. Um, I think it's normal within a studio, though. Like I've lost a project to Bernie. Uh, Bernie's lost a project to me. So that's just the way it goes. As long as it stays within the building, you know what I mean? Everybody gets to work tomorrow. So yeah, you're keeping um, the lights on no matter who's putting it out. Yeah. I mean, everybody gets their shine, you know, in, to some degree and, and works 
their ass off to to keep the reputation going you know like i think that that's part of why it's fun to work here is like you know that there's nobody really out to get you <laughs> you know you might hear footsteps from other people and i have a lot of mastering friends who do great work that i admire and wish i was them sometimes but within the studio it's 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 a really good environment and and encouraging and and productive and helpful it's it's great because that's kind of what you would dream of right like i get to go in my room do the thing that i do and work with people that aren't out to screw me up okay i'm good with that we talked with um the mixing engineer that did kanye's first few albums right and when you think of guys like him and guys like you who worked with kendrick for so long and it's like like rap in itself is so competitive and so i got here by myself right that one, once you start looking into it and it's like well yeah you did like kanye and kendrick are obviously extremely talented geniuses sure. but also like there's a mixing and mastering artist behind there and it's nice to know that it's kind of more wholesome behind the scenes like yeah we care we want kendrick to do well we're going to put in the effort to get this you know Right. Well, I mean, I I think that goes back to the earlier comment about the team that you work with, right? Like the guys at TDE are tight. And I think the reason why they've continued to come back and work with me is because I fit into the way they operate. Like they're hardworking guys. They want to work at crazy hours of the day. Mastering for all intents and purposes is like a doctor's appointment, right? We're open from nine to six or 10 to six or whatever. And you book some time and we do your thing. Well, what am I going to say? No to Kendrick to work at one o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. I'm what am I stupid? So (laughs) they appreciate that hustle. I appreciate their hustle and we've all been successful. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, um, naive of the, the, the idea that I am attached to him and, and shot, a little bit up because of him i owe a lot to that team um so i'll forever be indebted to them i'm just one of those guys though i think i just work my butt off and i'm afraid of not being able to come to work again whether that's rational or not i was wondering when you you've been nominated for i think dozens of grammys at this point uh, you. <laughs> and, yeah. and you won one recently what is your first thought when you get another nomination or another win is it that mindset of great this is great for the studio we are solidifying our reputation in 2021 still or is it more personal like finally i'm getting the recognition i deserve like what is that initial gut reaction to those outside awards grammys or otherwise in the big scheme of things it's great to represent the studio it's great when there's multiple nominees coming out of the studio every year because it means that more work's probably going to be directed to you personally or to your studio um is it personally satisfying i think it meant you know grammys are weird for a lot of people Um, I think a Grammy has always meant something to me because I've always known what it was from the time I was a little kid. But after winning a Grammy, it it means something different. Um, I'm super thankful. I, I can always say I'm a Grammy winner. I'm super appreciative that This Is America won me my Grammy. Um, that song means a lot to me. I'm, I'm lucky to work with these people. But a a Grammy to me signifies a moment, a year, a song. And that's not to diminish what that means to people, because I'm a fan of songs that make me cry, make me happy, make me angry. And to think that I worked on something that made somebody else feel that way is very humbling. Um, But I want a career. I want longevity. I want to do this until I decide that I don't want to do this anymore. And if a Grammy along the way helps that, great. And if I don't ever win another one, I'm okay with that because I, you know, this is going to sound corny. I won a long time ago. I won before my first nomination came. No, that's not true. I came, (laughs) um, (laughs) I won 
like really, I won the goal that I set out for myself when I took this room over. So whether or not that Grammy nomination was going to happen or not, if the goal was met, that I was going to replace my mentor, I won. So yeah, I won. Um, and hopefully I'm going to continue to honor his legacy, my own legacy and the studio's legacy for as long as I can. Grammys get you a shine for a minute, but you know, talk to me in three years and then ask a random person who won the Grammy in the year I won a Grammy. And they'll say, I don't know. <laughs> so you know, I, I, longevity is what I'm after. The but the accolades are cool and they're very redeeming. Um, it's nice to share with your family. It's nice to share with your friends. It's nice to share with the people that watched you, whatever, struggle, miss out, sacrifice. Like it's all it's all redeeming. Um, but so is you know seeing somebody just send you an email on a Thursday that says, "Dude, I I listen to the track and I can't believe that." it sounds that good. Thank you. Like that reward for me has always been a nice one. You know what I mean? Like you have to, I, I think to survive over the long term, um, you have to look at all the little victories and sometimes it's, Hey, we got that album done on the first pass or sometimes it's, Hey, that album won an award or sometimes it's, Hey, that guy put his EP out and increased his streamers, 500 people. Like, I don't know. Measuring measuring success in this business is is odd. Did you feel like uh, when you're coming out with them, did you feel like that was going to be like a big moment? You had said that, you know, you're more concerned with like longevity. But right. did you did you realize, I guess, when I guess this is America came out that that was you're a part of something that would be a big moment for I, I think a lot of people, honestly. Right. Um. Not necessarily, it's, oddly enough. I think songs that that I'd worked on prior to that, I knew were going to be big songs. Like, oh, this is a smash. This is definitely going to be crazy, or this album is going to be met with great accolades. Uh, this is America was a uh, was like it, it's crazy if I think back to it. Um, Ali mixed that Derek Ali from the TDE camp, Engineers camp. Shout out to Ali. Um, like literally texted me, hey, I'm going to send you a track. Didn't tell me who it was. And and that's like, that's kind of how it works sometimes, right? So I just put the song up and mastered it and thought like, this is really cool. Let's get aggressive. It feels aggressive. You know, all the, all the standard things, but that, you know, Ali and I would discuss about a track or I would just inherently know that he wants out of it. I really don't think it, it, it hit me like, whoa, until they paired it with the video. When I saw the video, it was over. Like, mm. and I, I'll be the first to tell you that song, that song doesn't win a Grammy without a video. That's my take. I mean, that doesn't say that the, the song isn't important and the message is in the song. The message is also in the visual for a lot of people, you know? So I think the combination of those two things was really powerful. And Again, like uh, I think more time passes and I'll be able to look back at that with a different perspective and really, really, really appreciate it. But yeah, I mean, when I saw the two together, it was it was a, this is a, this is going to be a whole lot of trouble. Do you have any other moments like that where something you didn't really think about in the moment? Like you you worked on Damn for Kendrick. And at that point, like, you know, that's going to be big notoriety, right. all that. Do you have any other moments where it's just a job, just another Tuesday for you, and then the song comes out and it's huge? Do you have many surprises like that these days? Yes and no. I think, you know, there's still there's still part of me that wants to be anti everything and, and and doesn't want to root for whatever the big the big pushed song of the day is or whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, I still hear songs and go, wow, this is going to be huge or, you know, like I have kids and all the Doja Cat's a perfect example. Like I worked on her album prior to her last one and I liked Doja Cat. I thought she was fun. And, and my kids kind of gave me the background at that time of who Doja Cat was. I think she was more of a YouTube person, maybe. I don't know. Um, or SoundCloud or whatever it was. But her stuff was always fun. So to see her like now, succeed in an era where people who are making music like that are succeeding 
like it's fun for me to see people like that win and and know part of her team and watch them win a, along with it. But the flip side of that coin is I hear a lot of stuff that is phenomenal that nobody will ever hear. And I guess that's, mm. you know, the the behind the curtains part of this job that is, you know, sometimes it's inspiring and sometimes it's defeating because you really root for people who have great things to say or great music or messages that just don't get the same kind of traction. What songs or artists specifically? Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw names. I'll just say like, there's a, there's just a lot of non-mainstream music. That's great. Yeah. Period. Sure. And, and that could be any genre you like. And like I was saying earlier, I listen to, I listen to a lot of music. I listen to a lot of jazz. Like why, why doesn't jazz win? <laughs> you know, or heavy metal or any of those things. But this business is very cyclical. Um, and I'm sure those things will make a comeback eventually. But like right now, hip hop and R&B for the past 20 years, 30 years owns music. You're still a fan. Like, does it does music get to a point for you where you you see the moving parts and it just kind of becomes a science or is it still like man turning on the radio turning on spotify you're still jamming out just enjoying it for what it is um i am an older cat who will put his windows down and make younger cats roll their windows up and that's because i love to listen to loud music in my car like i did when i was a kid i don't ever want to not do that you drive down the freeway with your windows down. You're blasting the, that song, whatever that song is. Yeah, I'm still that guy. And I always want to be that guy. I also recognize like there's times where I feel like I got to step away from this and clear my head or, or you know, cleanse the palate, so to speak. Sometimes that's through a different genre of music. And sometimes that's from literally not coming to work and not listening to music for a while. Um, other times it's like get fully immersed in everything I can and be inspired by all the new music. So like right now I'm in a, I'm not listening to a lot of music stage, you know, last summer I was listening to things incessantly. So I think it ebbs and flows, but yeah, I'm still, I still get excited to come here every day. It, that's the great part. Like I said earlier about engineering is it's a new thing every morning. It's it's good to hear that the excitement is still there because you read interviews with comedians and most of them say, no, I don't watch comedies. Like, that's what I do. Or you read about doctors that they can't even look at people as people anymore. They're just like parts to them. So that's that is very precious to keep that excitement alive. It's it's detrimental. <laughs> but, but, I mean, like I. I I'm obsessive about it for sure. Uh, I think I, I go through my periods, like I said, where I'll just critique myself. Like that's, and I think that that's why when you're earlier asking about like, would I tell anybody no to something if they wanted to try something? Like I, I'm more critical of anything I'm doing wrong. So I'm totally open to the constructive criticisms or just straight up nope criticisms. Because, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just trying to give you what I think is best. But ultimately, you're going to know what that is. Did it take you a while to develop that mindset? Or has that been there from the start? Like when you were a, a mentee learning the ropes, was that still where you were at? Or was there ever a point in time where you were more full of yourself and, no, this is the way I'm going to do it? Yeah, no, I don't. Um, well, I don't know that that's a thing. Right. It, for for a mastering guy, I'm sure other people will tell you that mastering people have a sound. I just I like I know what I like and all my touchstones are varied, you know, like I, they go back to the 60s and up to today and and little touchstones of every genre or every era. Still apply to new music, right? Like the way a guitar sounds and something new might be reminiscent of something old. And to have a library in your head of maybe the way those sounds should sound. Otherwise, I'm I like I said, I'm gonna draw from things that are similar to that, right? Like when I did SZA's Control album for the next year and a half, every female artist that 
booked with me wanted to sound like Scissors Control album. And that's fine, but all of the things that I might have done on Scissors Control album weren't based off of Scissors Control album. They were based off of maybe a disco sound or a soulful vibe or the warmth of a bass guitar or the top end of her vocal range. I believe in anything that you do, if you really want to do it, like immerse yourself in it. I could just listen to hip hop and probably be a good hip hop mastering engineer. But I think I'm better because I listen to a little bit of everything and can figure out a way to kind of cross genre those ideas. I don't know. Like music has always been music to me. I don't know that I was ever walking around genre specific <laughs> as a kid because I was exposed to a ton of music and it was just natural to like music. I don't know. Like, you you can answer this for me. Do you know anybody that doesn't like music? Yes, definitely. <laughs> that person is not your friend. <laughs> no, no. I, I think from a from an outside listenership, it is very easy to just get locked into, and even within hip hop, like no, this is real hip hop. That's not hip hop. I like oh, yeah. this. Yeah. Everything else is garbage. Like, I think that mindset exists. Definitely not healthy. Right, but. From the flip side, I think once you get into music, you start appreciating everything. Even though I don't listen to a bunch of heavy metal, Brendan will still send me some heavy metal albums and be like, hey, this is good. I like it. And good I job, Brendan. <laughs> find pieces of it that I like. And uh, yeah, it, it is contagious once you, you are passionate about it. I'm still trying to win Brendan over with my stuff, but you know. It's just not doing it for him. <laughs> hey, some stuff. Some stuff. I, you haven't got me on a hosier quite yet, but yeah, I, hosier is our sticking point. I'm a big hosier head. I have. I'm. Not, I'm staying out of your arguments. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying about listening to everything, I kind of feel like a lot of people have that. I feel like we're more or less kind of going towards like a post genre type of music where. You know, like everybody's kind of listening to everything and like you can hear that in a lot of different artists where there's influences from you know a number of sources i i think you're right i think it's great honestly um you know i'm an 80s kid 80s 90s kid so a lot of your identity was you know what are you right now like i had a heavy metal phase i had a hip-hop phase i had a heavy metal hip-hop phase i still have a heavy metal hip-hop phase it's it. I just it's interesting. I was sorry to venture off here. I read an article where they were saying like your musical tastes develop to thirty or something, and after thirty, they really don't expand to different genres. And I find the absolute opposite to be true for myself. I'm listening to way more varied music now, and I think it's twofold. I think it's just being older, doing what I do. I want to be exposed to it. But to your point, there's more available. There's more like what is even in a hip hop, a hip hop song. What is that instrument playing? Wow, that's an Indian instrument. Maybe I'll check out what that instrument is that leads you to some Indian artist. And you're like, yeah, this isn't necessarily my jam, but I can dig it. And I can like I feel some kind of way about it. And that's what music is, right? We all speak this language because we connect to it even when there's no words. It makes you feel a way. Even if that is, yeah, that ain't for me, you fell a way about it. I think there is a there is an element of if you are a person who is genuinely interested in music, like being open to all of it is kind of a prerequisite for that. You either have it or you don't. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I I'd say I love all kinds of music. I still struggle with country. I know that I, <laughs> I can count how many country albums I've mastered on both hands. I want to do more country music, but, you know, I don't have to love it to, to appreciate it and, and do my job and know what, what it needs, you know, know what sounds good to me. That, But I'm sure there are guys that would say the same thing about mastering hip hop who primarily master country albums yeah not a huge crossover there i don't think mm -mm. 
besides Lil Nas X at this point. I'll work with that, dude. Bring <laughs> bring me your tracks, Lil Nas X. <laughs> <laughs> this is a formal invitation. We will get that. <laughs> yes. We'll get that onto his Twitter feed. Did you get in touch with his people? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we have those connections for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh uh, what you were saying about listening to a hip hop album and finding that that Indian guitar or something like that. Mm-hmm. That is crazy to me that people that are so in the industry can still find things to pick out and be like wow that is something new and i want to learn more about it is there something specifically with mastering like a a technique or a new software new innovation that you can think of that's made you excited about mastering again or has mastering kind of not not plateaued but has the tools the instruments for mastering remained fairly constant for for our studio they have um and and that's going to lead me into talking about the studio a little background for a second all mastering up until the 90s well 80s probably um late 80s was analog mastering so you were mastering through an analog board analog tape to an analog source master and then that turned to a a digital tape, but it was still tape as a master. And now masters are all digital files and flying around. We've always prided ourselves, and Bernie has is, is built the studio on the premise of, you know, building things in-house better than we can buy in retail. And he's been successful at doing that. Um, we build our own power supplies. We build our own cables, wiring to the boards. We build the boards. Um, We modify almost every piece of outboard gear or commercially available gear that we have, as do other mastering studios. I don't think we're unique in that. But it's really only the past 20 maybe years where you're seeing a lot of mastering software and in turn, a glut of new mastering engineers. Um, And I'm not saying they're not mastering engineers. It's it's just changed the game, right? When I came into this business, you had to go to a studio um, that was pretty much built to be a mastering studio, or you sat down with a pair of headphones and, and, you know, some gear somewhere and and tried to make it work. Um, Now you can, you could master from your bedroom if you bought, a couple hundred dollars worth of software. I'm not that guy. I don't want to be that guy. I do some hybrid stuff where I do analog mastering mixed in with some digital processing. Um, but but I like being in the lane I'm in, so to speak, with my gear because I, I've honed my skills on this gear. I know how to get things out of this board that maybe your average guy with a plug-in wouldn't think to do. And to me, plugins like they they do serve a purpose. I would probably get a little lost in them. I, I fear uh, if I played around with them too much because it feels like there's an infinite number of combinations. And part of the way my console set up helps with my workflow that I make decisions a little bit quicker than get lost in it because I I could master your song all day when really it should take me about a half an hour. So. <laughs> Um, I I think the way that the studio has been built and our reputation built off of that, um, Bernie being this innovator to that point, even though we're now in a more new technical age, like we're talking on a computer right now, um, I'm sending digital files, receiving digital files and all that. Like we still cut vinyl and vinyl, the process of cutting vinyl is, it has never changed. Like that's still an analog like the playback that you record to make the vinyl is a digital source, but the process of actually cutting grooves in the records, which we do here, that's the same as it's always been. That's an analog thing. So I just think that Bernie Grumman Mastering as a studio, while we always try and upgrade our sound chain, our clarity of sound, because it's vitally important to us, we also pay respect to, you know, what got us here. You know, we're we're stoked that people are have rediscovered vinyl in the past 10, 15 years. 
because that room here at the studio is in constant use. And it wasn't always the case. Um, in the later 90s, a lot of mastering studios kind of got rid of their vinyl cutting lathes because they figured we're going digital, right? That's that's going like the way of the cassette tape. Well, that's back now too. I don't understand, but whatever. It's hard to say. I, I've never mastered anywhere else, right? I've never mastered on somebody else's rig. Um, I don't want to do that. Uh, knock on wood, I can keep coming here until they, you know, shut it all down. Um, but there's new technologies all the time that I am aware of um, that I compete with. But I, I'm still... I still feel like I got the edge. And until that feels like I'm slipping, I probably won't introduce a whole lot of new bells and whistles into the you know system that's already working. Just kind of keep upgrading what's here. You, you can decide if you want to answer this, but you said something about once you, you are so well established, so in your prime, as it were, with your equipment, with your knowledge, everything. What is the total time for an average song or or even this is america for example like what what is a grammy award-winning song the mastering process start to finish ballpark time it took to to get that done 45 minutes that's insane to me that, <laughs> <laughs> well that is just a tuesday for you as well like, here, but, here you go. But, but stop for a minute we got to back your recording up 40 minutes to where i said <laughs> You worked for 30 years to get that great, experience. Great. Well, yes, I'll agree with that. You said it, though. Um, great products come out of great teams paying attention to great detail at every step of the way. That mix was phenomenal. So the mastering was easier than a mix that struggled and the mix was phenomenal because the team that recorded it was phenomenal. And the team that recorded it was phenomenal because the production was phenomenal. You know what I mean? So it, yeah. it's easier to do things when it comes to you on a platter. And I just put some turtle wax on it. Like that's, that's my favorite compliment from one of my favorite people I've ever met in this business, Neil Pogue. He sends his things over and I ask him for direction. And he goes, man... Just put the turtle wax on it. Like, I know what that means to him. Back to you saying, Tyler saying, make it sound gross. I know what turtle wax means to that guy. That's also why I think I can tell you from the behind the scenes perspective. Yeah, it's like, holy shit, that took me that long and I got that accolade. And I think I would struggle with that if I haven't backed that up with good work since or good work before. Like, I, I don't want to be a flash in the pan. You're definitely being very kind to the whole team, and I'm sure they're doing great. But just that idea that, yeah, you could win a Grammy in about 45 minutes. When you become a rapper, I really want that to be like an opening bar. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hold your breath. Um, <laughs> I mean, granted, if, if a big name artist calls you, if Post Malone has a song coming out, I'm going to wonder if it's going to be a huge hit. Because he's got a track record of huge hits. Is that because of my mastering? I don't know. Am I going to tag my name onto that when it applies? Hell yeah, because everybody else is. And I want to keep working. I don't think you can try and win a Grammy. I really don't. I don't think you set out to do it. I've had people come in my room and say, I think this one's going to win a Grammy. And then it wins a Grammy. But I don't think anybody said, we wrote this song, we mixed this song, we're mastering the song to win Grammys. Yeah, they are definitely a roll of the dice. But the the skill level involved to do top shelf, top quality work at this point in your career is, it's great. Like, I love thinking about a mastering engineer doing the best job that could be done. And then that's, you know... 45 oh. minutes that's an hour and that is what should be done to that record that song well right but there are other times where i spend a week on somebody's song that doesn't really ever go anywhere and it that person deserves the 
you know, it's not like I have a level mastering and then independent level mastering. Like you're getting the best I've got, no matter who you are. What what's successful in this business? I, I stopped trying to figure that out a long time ago because a lot of things that I rooted for that weren't even things I worked on, just were fans of, you know, don't win to the degree any of us think they should, or we all have our favorite snubs. Do you do you have uh, Grammys aside, just a, a project that you've worked on or an artist that you've worked on that you really, you wanted them to get more attention, like you really believed in them as an artist? Yeah, I work with a few. Um, there's this kid who just put a song out today and I put it up on my Instagram. His name's Don Lifted, at Don Lifted. He's out of Memphis, Tennessee, and I met him when I first started taking over this room. So I think uh, maybe our meeting was a weird meant to be thing, but like he had one of the first attended sessions after I took the room over and he was super complimentary. And I just really dug his his vibe and I really dug his music. And like earlier when I said I like people in here, like I like to know who people are like I want if you bring your your mom to the session, that's cool. I'll meet your mom. Like I care about those kinds of things. And this kid just had a real nice attitude and, and we got along and like, I'm cheering for him. And I mastered his first album and I just mastered his second album and he signed a deal with a label and like to watch somebody have success like that. I want to cheer for him forever. Right. Even if his label says, well, you can't go master with that mic guy anymore. We want you to go master over here. That guy's my friend. I still want him to to win, you know. Um, there's lots of that. Like I love rooting for people. Understanding like not all of them are gonna make a chart topping album, and that's okay. Like I like knowing that you came back to work on a second album. Like how many people get to do that? Um, so to maybe lend a hand or support or encourage somebody along the way if I can do that as well like yeah i'm a, i'm a dude i'm a fan i'm a fan of music and people and people's music i i don't think you could end an episode of a podcast on a more uplifting note uh, <laughs> wow i didn't set out for all that <laughs> <laughs> that is that is just a perfect bow to put on it though that you just want to see people succeed and you're the guy making it happen for a lot of people and it's it's been such a, a pleasure talking to you. We really appreciate it. Just a, a peek behind the the curtain of the music world is is great. I love doing this, and I definitely think people should hear perspectives from people like you. So thank you. Oh, well, I appreciate you guys asking. And, and again, yeah, there's a lot of people that do a lot of great work consistently in this business. Um, and it's nice that guys like you are... are kind of seeing that and and pointing that out so i appreciate it and thank you great well brendan you got any uh final questions you want to throw out mike here yeah is there anything you're trying to you know plug or anything you want to put on here before we wrap it all up the one thing i have not learned how to do because i'm too old is monetize anything <laughs> so right. um no i mean if, if you're interested in some of the work i do uh, you can follow me on Instagram at mastered by Mike. Um, I usually just post some, you know, some of the projects that I'm working on sometimes in my story, some singles I'm working on, maybe a thing or two from around the studio. But if it's of any interest to you, uh, yeah, give a follow there. You can kind of see my discography and, and uh, as I'm working on it, that's about it. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Mike. We Thank will. You link your instagram i love i love that you plugged your instagram <laughs> well that's all i got so <laughs> we will we'll link it all we'll Great. put it in the description for now we are signing off from the land of ten thousand hot takes it's been peyton kaiser brendan haley and mike Bosey.